Welcome to the Student Pilot Podcast. My name is Simon Callis, a flight school owner. Each week, myself and my guests will be talking all things flight training and beyond to help inspire, motivate and support you on your journey to becoming a private or commercial pilot. So welcome to the podcast, everybody. This week, we have aircraft engineer, airline pilot, aviation consultant and now published author Steve Ford on the show. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. No problem at all. So, wow, what an interesting and broad career you have. (laughs) It's it's great. Can we go back to the beginning, though, and just tell us where where it all began, where your interest came with aviation? Yes, certainly. I think, uh, to be honest, it was my father. I grew up in in an aviation environment. Um, My father was an engineer, aircraft engineer, Mm -hmm. and he became a flight engineer. And uh, his first uh, employment was with uh, Caledonian Airways, uh, an airline in the UK, with DC-7s, Britannias, Boeing 707s, and he eventually ended up on the DC-10 as a flight engineer. Oh, wow. Okay, so you, you grew up around all this stuff, right? From yeah, absolutely. So. so my early recollections are uh, of being handed from station engineer to station engineer around the planet. Uh, in those days, the aircraft were used primarily for charter, mm-hmm. for uh, moving uh, either cargo or uh, troops or uh, Uh, inclusive tour holidays Mm -hmm. and uh, I remember as a child my brother and I being handed to uh, a crew in South End to fly on a Britannia down to uh, East Africa which was empty and we just played football up and down an empty (laughs) aeroplane. Wow can you tell us um your first engine so your first job was engineering is that right? Yeah so what happened was uh, obviously I grew up in that environment and uh, I started as an engineering clerk at Gatwick uh, Airport Mm -hmm. and uh, from that it was uh, pretty obvious to me pretty quickly that I wanted to be involved in aviation hands-on. Yeah. Managed to get an apprenticeship with the British Caledonian Airways Mm -hmm. and uh, did uh, served a full apprenticeship with them uh, which allowed me to gain uh, engineering licenses and uh, what I did because of uh, the ability to travel to the States I made sure I gained uh, an American A&P qualification as well as British uh, airframe and engine licenses yeah and uh, that uh, allowed me to progress within engineering okay so at this point your flight training journey hadn't yet started Uh, can you tell us when that did start and and, in what form yeah so it was uh, again being in that environment I wanted to uh, fly and uh, the opportunity presented itself to start taking lessons in the UK uh, that was at Shoreham, which is down on the south coast, and in yeah. those days uh, there was no paved runway, yeah. so it tended, tended to flood. Mm. So uh, when I started my flying lessons, I was still serving an apprenticeship as an engineer, and uh, quickly I found it challenging with uh, Shoreham, Goodwood, and Red Hill constantly in the winter being flooded out. Yeah. So I had to find a solution, and the solution was... Uh, an unusual one. It was uh, Long Beach, California. Tell us about that then. So you moved out there to... Yes. So so the way I managed to work it was because I had access to uh, uh, airline concessions, I literally used my uh, vacation time, worked in pubs and bars, uh, saved every penny I could, and then took blocks of time in uh, Long Beach. Uh I actually stayed uh, in an engineer's Winnebago on his driveway (laughs) and... uh, Gained my private pilot's license in uh, in Long Beach. Excellent. Returned to the UK and then uh, transferred that to a British private pilot's license. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the next obvious step was to take a share in an aeroplane yeah. and uh, start uh, building up some experience. Okay. And then you moved on through um, UK, Multi and IR? Yeah, so I did it in stages. So what I did was I realised that I-, I wanted to pursue flying commercially and even though I had a very, very good job with British Caledonian as a power plant development engineer, I, uh, I quit, which was, uh, which was a, a, a brave thing to do at the time, and it was yeah. the right thing to do at the time for yeah. me personally. And uh, I spent the next three years uh, back and forwards to uh, Texas in order to, to gain a multi-engine yeah. IR. I became a, a CFII uh, instructor mm. instrument as well and multi-engine instrument instructor. Uh, that was fantastic because what it did was it allowed me to, uh, to gain experience on a, on, a, on a variety of aircraft. 
Uh, that included Cessna 182s, mm. uh, Beach Barons mainly, 55 Barons and 58 Barons, and uh, even uh, the opportunity to, to get my hands on uh, King Air C90. Oh, wow. Excellent. And then, so moving on from there, can you tell us about your, your first pilot job? Yeah, so the first commercial job was when I was back in the UK. Obviously, I had to uh, convert to uh, British CAA licenses and had to do uh, all of that over again. So uh, the ground school was all done at Cass College in London. Mm -hmm. And I was actually here at Coventry with uh, Atlantic Flight Training, oh, wow. doing the instrument rating Excellent. and multi-engine on uh, their uh, Cessna yeah. uh, at the time, the 310 that they had. Yeah. Uh, that uh, allowed me to then have the qualifications to start looking for employment. Excellent. So to answer your question, uh, I had a bit of an advantage, and, and it's something to bear in mind, certainly for students, uh, when they're going through their, their, their training and their courses, if they want to go commercial, if they can gain experience and hours in their logbook on, on twin engine aircraft, mm -hmm. grab it. Yeah. Because what it did was it allowed me to knock on doors, not just with a, a license in my hand, but experience, three mm. years of experience of flying twins. Mm. And uh, I literally knocked on hangar doors. Uh, yeah. You know, we've got the internet, we've got all sorts of mechanisms now to apply for jobs, but uh, you can't beat the old fashioned yeah. uh, I think that, that stands out now, doesn't it? But if people take a more direct approach over just emailing like everybody else would, I think it, that does make you stand out. And also it's about timing. I'm a great believer in the law of timing. Yeah. Uh, none of us know what's around the corner. And I knocked on the hangar door on a Friday, yeah. the day that one of their pilots had uh, resigned to join Air Europe. Right. And I, I started with that company at uh, Biggin Hill, a company yeah. called Shore Wings, on the Monday. Uh, <laughs> they uh, had a King Air Beach 350, yeah. which, uh, which I uh, flew as a first officer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know when I had my interview, but I did the day I joined. They also had citations, and they quickly put me on a citation course. Wow. And uh, within months, I was then on to citation ones and twos, which then gave me jet time. Yeah. And that then allows you to start to build that experience base and uh, it takes a lot of energy and effort. There's a lot of work that goes into uh, type ratings, mm -hmm. but uh, it pays off because it shows to the next employer that, that you're prepared to put that energy and effort into something and you're, you're worth betting on because you're capable of getting through, through yeah. the course. So tell us about how your career progressed then from Shore Wings, because you've, you've got a real vast experience on various different aircraft. Um, so if we can go through how it sort of progressed up until your, your last job in aviation. Yeah, so what happened was Shore Wings uh, was uh, going through some challenges and it eventually closed down. And I, I could see that it was time to, to, to move and see what opportunities uh, were there. And fortunately, there were. I joined uh, Novair International, which... Uh, was a charter inclusive tour operator and I joined as a first officer on the 737-400. Mm -hmm. I then converted onto the DC-10. Nice. I Well, it was lovely for 30 days because right. uh, <laughs> because uh, the airline closed. Oh, no. uh, I, I did my base training in Shannon on a DC-10 on the 21st of March and on the right. 31st of March the airline closed. Mm. So that's another lesson in uh, this industry that, that you will have knocks. Yes. You will get to a point where you think, why me? Why has that happened? Well, yeah. sadly, that's life and that's the industry we're in. Yeah. There are changes that you have to uh, adapt and uh, uh, work with. So what I did was I applied to various companies and the opportunity presented itself to fly and work for British Aerospace. Mm -hmm. British Aerospace uh, at that time was a commercial aircraft division and I was hired to work on the uh, uh, Hawker program, the 125s, the 800 and the 1000. Mm -hmm. uh, British Aerospace trained me to uh, do production flight tests because of my engineering and flying qualifications. That was mainly out of uh, Harden, Chester. The development flight test on the 1000 was at uh, Woodford. Mm -hmm. uh, Woodford is near Manchester. And from that, it then allowed us to work on a uh, demonstration program where we took the aircraft worldwide, wow. demonstrating in all four corners. 
So all, all that aviation engineering experience you had led you into a new opportunity, effectively. Yes, and if, if anyone is listening who has other strings to their bow, whether it be uh, flight operations experience, uh, ground handling, uh, anything within the industry that is in addition to your flying skills yeah. will often come into to play when it comes to opportunities. So mm-hmm. because I had the engineering background and a flying qualification and experience, uh, it didn't mean I was any better than anyone else and far from it. But what it did do was it opened opportunities and doors for me to, to work both sides of the fence. Yes. So with British Aerospace, I worked uh, on uh, some of the certification programs and uh, worked with uh, the FAA and, and Honeywell on uh, some avionics. And from that, I was then able to uh, progress. Raytheon took over British Aerospace corporate jets. The opportunity to move to the United States was there, but I chose to join uh, an airline with uh, big red engines. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and uh, and with them, what, what aircraft were you tight rated on with them? So Virgin Atlantic is obviously who we're talking about for yeah. those <laughs> yeah, that yeah. Uh, haven't picked up on that. Uh, I was with Virgin Atlantic for 23 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, again, because of my engineering background, was asked to be the technical pilot initially on the A340. Yeah. And I flew the A320, A330, A340. Uh, I was also fortunate enough uh, as a result of the uh, work with Airbus as a guest of theirs to fly the A380. Uh, On the Boeing fleet, uh, I flew uh, as captain on the 747-100, 200 and the 747-400. Wow. It's a real, real range of aircraft. Well, there's a few great, courses, a lot of training. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I didn't have a training file, I had a filing cabinet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So after 23 years then, what was it that made you think, do you know what, I don't want to do commercial anymore? What was the... Well, I think in, in life, we get to a point when we recognise that it's the right time to make a change. And mm. uh, it wasn't a change that was forced upon me. Uh, the airline industry is very volatile. I was fortunate uh, to uh, survive uh, redundancies and changes within the industry when major events took place, like mm. 9-11, yeah. uh, SARS, which was the forerunner to COVID, mm. uh, the volcanic ash in oh, yeah. Iceland. Yeah, I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, it's a very... It's a very challenging industry to work in, mm. in as much as it's very susceptible to change. So yeah. if, if there's a global event that, that uh, impacts it. And the change that I chose to make was a personal one, in as much as I have and had a fantastic aviation career. Uh, in parallel, I, had a, I did have other commercial interests within aviation. We uh, operated an FBO, mm-hmm. uh, which uh, I enjoyed. I also kept very much hands-on with general aviation. Yes. Uh, general aviation has, throughout my career, um, been the core, really, mm. in as much as uh, I restored aircraft, uh, various aircraft, uh, Moonies, uh, Barons, uh, a Beach Sundowner, not mm-hmm. so long ago, and, and recently a PA-28. Which we've, we've now using, so it's... <laughs> no, it's a lovely aircraft, it really is. But to answer your question, Simon, uh, it was a personal decision... Uh, I think people get to a point where they 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 decide what's best for them and their family. Yeah. Uh, I made the choice. I've got no regrets. I've no regrets at all. Yeah. Uh, it was the right thing to do at the right time. Yeah, I think that with any career, you sort of get to a point where you think I've had my best out of this now, and I want a, a new challenge. A lot of the time. Yeah, I, I, I certainly wasn't burnt out. I still have yeah, a. I, yeah. I think I think we all have a fire in our belly. Yeah. Uh, that allows us to exactly. to to enjoy what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I I certainly have enjoyed the the, the last uh, few years with the, some of the projects I've been involved in. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about your next adventure, and so that's becoming a published author. Can you tell us how that came about? Yeah, so I think when I retired from Virgin Atlantic, you spend two years adjusting, to, first of all, to be in the t- same time zone. Yes. I mean, your sleep patterns and your lifestyle as a long-haul airline pilot mm-hmm. uh, are, are disruptive. Yeah. Uh, it took two years to uh, decompress, uh, and then what I realized was, was that when I look back, you know, British Caledonian Airways, British Aerospace, 
virgin a lot of what i was part of was actually part of history mm -hmm. and i've always had an interest in history mm -hmm. so 20 west was the book that i published first of all and and the reason for for publishing it was it covers and it says on the title uh, a journey through six decades of turbulent change within aviation yeah absolutely so uh, i wanted to capture a snapshot of of some of the experiences but more importantly the people because yeah. uh, it's not it's not just about airplanes no. it's it, it's it's about people yeah. and i was very fortunate to to fly and work with some very very competent very very capable people yeah. within the industry and have some experiences uh, you know there is tragedy in in, in anything associated with uh, uh, an industry such as uh, aviation yeah. but i wanted to capture the, the the good the good part as well yeah and that was the inspiration absolutely that's brilliant and i i've, I've got to be honest i've got a, a copy of this book which you kindly gave me i haven't yet uh, got through it so uh, i'm not going to tell anybody what's in it or anything like that spoil it but we did have this idea, didn't we, that we could get you back on the show to read some of your books yes. to the listeners. Yeah, I, well, I, leave parts of them anyway. Yeah, I, I think I think I'd be more than happy to do that because, in addition to writing Twenty West, uh, I've wrote for uh, Aviation Business Magazine in the Middle East, yeah. and also have had some work published uh, in in the States, uh, Airfax Journal, yeah. and some various blogs. Uh, so what I did was I pulled these together uh, into flight envelopes, which mm -hmm. is a collection of uh, opinion pieces, yeah. uh, both engineering, flight operations, aerospace, and even space, which which has been interesting because what it does do is it stimulates uh, debate and discussion. Yes. Uh, I've always said that if you put five pilots in a room, oh, yeah. you'll have <laughs> 10 opinions. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. So that's flight envelopes. That's like our instructor meeting. <laughs> but um, no, so what we're going to do is we're going to just do like a couple of chapters, I think, wasn't it? From, you know, one from each, each book. Um, yeah. And then it, within the show notes of this podcast, there are links where you can purchase the books, both books that are there. Sorry, we have got aeroplanes in the background, but we are at an airport, believe it or not. <laughs> so we'll put those in the show notes. One thing I'll add, if I may, is yeah, that uh, Flight Envelopes is on a, a winter special, 99 cents, 99 well, pence. That's uh, on, e uh, on e-books. So yeah. uh, Kindle and Apple Books uh, have been loaded with, uh, with the uh, Flight Envelopes. And in euros, it's also 99 cents. Excellent. Can you tell viewers as well where they can find you on social media, Steve? Yes, yeah, certainly. So I do have a website, which is uh, 20westbook.com, and that's 20westbook.com. Mm -hmm. On uh, Instagram, it's Steve, obviously uh, lowercase, and then underscore Ford underscore author. So that's Steve underscore forward underscore author yeah. uh, and uh, also uh, on YouTube uh, 20 West book and also on Facebook which is 20 West book brilliant so thank you ever so much Steve for coming onto the show and sharing your journey with us it's uh, it's an incredible journey um, but you guys can find a lot more about Steve on on social media and by reading his books so well, I hope you enjoyed the podcast don't forget to like subscribe to the channel Ding the bell for uh, more notifications for the next episode. And please do, if you get a chance, leave us a review. It really does help us grow the channel. And, uh, and also get a copy of Steve's books. They're excellent. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe and ding the bell to receive notifications of the next episode.